In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear sisters, dear faithful, we begin the final two weeks of Lent, the time of the Passion. We should look at Lent, and Passion Tide in particular, but even all of life, as a climb up Calvary's hill. At the summit is our Lord, his arms outstretched, reaching for souls, reaching for each one of us. Our gaze on him, whatever sufferings we bear, whatever sacrifices we undertake, we should do all with a desire to follow the path that he has forged so that one day we can be united to him as we ought to be, united internally, seeing as he sees, loving as he loves, giving ourselves as he gives himself. Love's goal is always the same. It desires union. Perfect union can be had only by the gift of self, a gift which by definition must be willing. We are not forced in Lent or in life. It's the love of our Lord which draws us. It's the love of our Lord which pushes us. Something very important to keep in mind when we consider the sufferings of our Lord, especially in these next two weeks, is that they were voluntary, that he willed them, he chose them. It didn't have to be the way it was. He chose them because it was the best way, the best way to convince us, to convince all mankind and each one of us individually just how far the love of God goes. He wanted to make it clear to us, too, that it was a voluntary offering. And there are many things that he did and many things that he said that show that. But one particularly striking incident was presented to us in the liturgy of just a couple of days ago, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. This event illustrates beautifully that our Lord wanted to die for us. The context, our Lord spent most of the last three months before he died, actually outside of Judea. And it got to a point where he no longer walked openly at all in Judea. He was basically in hiding. That's why during these last couple of weeks, we cover the cross and we cover every statue except the Passion, the Stations, because we're wanting to make, to acknowledge the shame that we have for the fact that our God came to this earth and had to hide from mankind. He was in hiding because his enemies had made clear their intent to kill him. At this point, they had already made three clear attempts. One of them we read about in today's gospel. Those who knew of our Lord's whereabouts were commanded by the priests to report them under pain of excommunication. You're out of the temple if you put your lot with this man. And so he spent his time outside of Judea and mostly in Peria, which was Herod's territory. Herod was not a Jew. He didn't care about religious arguments that did not pertain to him. He was basically godless, in fact. So long as our Lord didn't attack him personally, the way John the Baptist did, and lost his head in consequence, he would be relatively safe. And then the news came from Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. It was very close to Jerusalem. It's about two miles his friend Lazarus, and scripture makes the point of, of being explicit, the one he loved was sick. This man was very dear to our Lord. He was a dear friend. He was sick. His sisters wanted our Lord to come to him, but to do so would entail great risk. And indeed, our Lord did not go, not right away. He lingered for a couple of days, and perhaps those who were there with him were thinking, 
He's afraid. Perhaps others were thinking, no, he's smart. It would be foolish to go back to Judea. And yet at a given point, that's exactly what he did. He turned to the apostles and he said, let us go into Judea again, into the enemy's lair. And the apostles did everything they could to convince him not to go. They reminded him of how he had nearly been stoned the last time he was there. But no, he insisted, he must go. Why? Lazarus was dead. He was determined. They were afraid. They were confused when he said, it will be for the glory of God. And yet, there was a certain courage too. Thomas it was who stood up and said to the others, okay, let us go with him and let us die with him. And they did. They went with him. It was our Lord's love which took him back into Judea. And it was not just his love for this man, Lazarus, his friend. It was his love for all souls. He clearly wasn't concerned about his own safety. And he didn't take the easy way out. If you think about it, he could have healed Lazarus from where he was. He had done that many times, similar things. And even when Lazarus was dead, he could have raised him from where he was. Likewise, he could have sort of slipped in under cover of night into Bethany as quietly as possible. He didn't do so. He went in openly. And once there, he worked what to, what to that point was the most spectacular miracle he had worked raising a man who had been dead four days, a man who was well-known, a man who was grieved openly by everyone, and they were there. What was the goal? Broadly, of course, it was souls, but specifically, what was our Lord doing? Why? Why did he do this? There are two things that might, that make sense. The first is that he wanted to make it clear he was God. There were souls disposed to believe, but as yet weak in their belief. And so he wanted to do something that would absolutely convince him. This is the Messiah. He is God. But it also makes sense. When we look at the context and the things we're considering here, he wanted to make sure that they would try to put him to death, those who were not disposed. Until this point, you understand, the Pharisees certainly hated him, and they were determined to put him to death when the opportunity presented itself. They had tried, they had not succeeded. They could not have someone else put him to death because they didn't have the political clout to do so. Those who had the political power were not the Pharisees, but the Sadducees. They were worldly-minded Jews. They used the Jewish religion. You might, you might compare them to Sunday Catholics. They did the externals, the bare minimum. That was all. And they used their religion to get power. They controlled the high priesthood. They ran the temple. They had the power. And they weren't so concerned up till now with what our Lord taught, with our Lord's teachings that the Pharisees said were heresies. As far as they were concerned, the Pharisees were heretics. They really didn't take too much interest in either one or the other. But now all of a sudden, they were more concerned. Our Lord was gaining too much notoriety, and he obviously had power. And they feared that because they were under a Roman occupier. They ruled, to a certain extent, under the Romans. And the Romans, although they were benevolent, if you were good, anytime they saw a threat or revolt, they were very stern and fierce. 
And so the high priest and the Sadducees were concerned that if our Lord looked to have too much power, if it looked like he could possibly lead a revolt, that the Romans would come in and smash everything and they would lose their positions. And so now for the first time, they agreed with the Pharisees, our Lord had to go and they had the power to do something about it. And so we see that our Lord deliberately, it would seem, galvanized his enemies against him. And by so doing, made it clear that he would deliberately lay down his life. His enemies would not one day catch up with him. No, he would, when the time was right, turn himself over to him. And that time was now very near. He would voluntarily give himself in sacrifice out of love for his father and love for souls. And it's important for us to realize that that determination to give everything to the last drop of his blood had to stay with him to the very last moment because he was God. And even when he was pinned to the cross and torn to shreds physically, he was still God and still could have said at any moment, that's enough. And you'll recall that they taunted him and dared him to do just that. It took a real will on his part to the very end to stay on the cross. He would give everything out of love. We reflect on these things, dear friends, because we have to realize always that when it comes to the practice of our faith, it's the willingness that is all. A willingness that springs from our love for our God and our love for souls. It's not merely this is what I have to do and I don't want to lose my own skin. It's charity which is meant to be to animate everything. Our efforts in Lent must be willing efforts. It's interesting that Holy Mother Church doesn't strictly oblige very much, but she encourages us much to choose things on our own, to make efforts on our own. Because those efforts prove love. Our efforts in Lent must be motivated by our love. They must be willing. And so must our efforts in life. The efforts to fulfill our vocation, to, to, to be faithful in our state of life, they must be willing efforts. We don't want to have ever, we don't want to ever fall into sort of looking for the easy way out or doing the bare minimum or doing what we do, but sort of weighing every effort that we make. Love doesn't count the cost. Love gives everything. And that's what faith is. That's what faith in practice is. So we generously embrace all that our state of life asks of us. And we generously accept all of the crosses that life brings us. Because that generosity proves our willingness and our love. And so as we approach Holy Week, when we look in a special way at the sufferings and heart of our Lord, we want to consider these things and ask our Lord and ask His Mother to give us the same spirit. Remembering that our goal, as we said in the beginning, was to see as He sees, to love as He loves, so that one day we can be united with him in heaven and with all of the souls that our efforts have brought with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.